Hi everyone, I'm Michelle McLean, your host for TIP International Radio, where we showcase top international professionals from around the globe, sharing their stories of inspiration and success. Well, today we are very excited to have a special guest joining us for TIP Radio, this amazing music industry executive who was the youngest VP in Columbia Records history, who is best known as the executive who signed Michael Jackson to Epic Records, has dedicated over six decades of his life to the music industry. He has proven himself as an expert when it comes to spotting talent and signing era-defining artists who truly created the soundtrack of their lives. He has impacted the lives of hundreds of artists. Those songs and albums have collectively sold in hundreds of millions starting with California Dreaming from the Mamas and Papas, which was the first single he promoted to WLS for Chicago-based Jamisa Distributing Company. He just cannot wait, we cannot wait, to learn more about this man's incredible history and his story. He's also receiving the IOTP's Lifetime Achievement Award in the music industry. Please, everybody, welcome to the show, the only, the one and only, Ron Alexenberg. Hi, Ron. Thank you for joining Thank us you. today. Thank you. I, I don't know if I can match your diction. It's perfect. So you speak so well, but thank you for that nice introduction. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. We are so honored to have you here today. And first off, an incredible bio. So I have to commend you on that. I don't even know where to begin, to be honest. You have such an amazing career filled with working with some of the most iconic musicians that have impacted the music industry, and you are a huge part of shaping their success of their careers. Tell our listeners, just tuning in for the first time, a little bit about your journey and what got you started in the music industry. Was it always something that you wanted to do? No. What, what, I, what I was doing, living in uh, Chicago, having wonderful parents, motivating me to finish school and my father uh, was a very successful businessman, and uh, he said, what are you going to want to be? And being on the south side of Chicago and seeing criminals being arrested all the time, I said, gee, maybe I should be a good criminal lawyer. So um, I figured one of the finest schools in the world was the University of Chicago. Little did I know how tough that would be to get in there. And... Uh, I was interviewed and they kind of like rejected me. And I was 16 years of age, uh, 17 years of age, and I was a professional bowler. And I had won my first check. Uh, and if you cash it, you're a professional. So I cashed it because I wanted to buy a car. And the check was for $3,000. And there was a car and a window and a Chevrolet dealership that I wanted. Uh, this will date everybody when I tell you I bought a 1957 Corvette convertible for $3,000. And I didn't have money to put the gas in the car. What I had to borrow it from my dad. And he said, now what are you going to do? And I said, well, you know, I'm going to see what kind of industry I can join and he owned a bowling alley and I would go into this bowling alley and people would operate a jukebox and in those days and they would come in and they'd empty the jukebox the records were the 45s and they were all worn out but I said what are you going to do with those and the guy said throw them away I said well, let me have them and I took them home and I flipped them over and I listened to what is called the b-side and uh, it got my taste of music. And when I was 13, 14, I wanted to play a trumpet. And that didn't work out because reading music was not that easy. But I played a little bit of the trumpet, which later on in my life led me to get involved with my first band called Chicago. From Chicago, horns trumpets, saxophones, trombones, you know, but uh, a buddy of mine, my father's actually, who was on his bowling team, he said, my son is a bum. He said, he, you know, he plays golf. He's a, almost a scratch golfer. 
He shoots pool because my father had Willie Moscone, one of the greatest pool players of all time, teach me how to shoot pool. Um, he's bowling um, and he's a bum. And he's not going to college. Uh, get him a job. And he called a friend of his uh, and he said, I got a buddy of mine, son, who needs a job in the music, needs a job in the to work. And he said, well, have him come in and meet with me. He came in, I meet with him. I go to work at an independent record distributor called Garmisa Distributing in Chicago, no longer exists. And I got my taste of the music business by being in a warehouse, picking orders, $75 a week, driving this magnificent car. And uh, the next day, I got there on a Friday. The next day, the owner, Lenny, said, God rest his soul, said, everyone, everybody to come to work Saturday. And I'm, yeah, okay. And we came to work and sat at a restaurant called B&G, which was later called Bugs and Germs on Michigan Avenue in Chicago. And he walks in and he says, okay, you eight people take that truck. There were two big trucks in front of the building. You take that and you eight take that. We get on the truck. He says, unload the boxes, put them on the sidewalk, don't open them. And the customers know to come and pick up by the box. And I said, curious, George, I got to open up and see what's inside here. And what was inside those boxes was the Hard Day's Night album by the Beatles. And we sold in one day about 30,000 albums. And in I said, day. in one day, I oh. said, this has got to be one of the most, there was 15,000, there was mono and stereo in those days. So there was one truck had the mono from United Artists. The other truck had the stereo, all emptied all putting them on the sidewalk on Michigan Avenue. Customers were coming in. They had to pay their bill what they owed. And then they got the box of records. Well, between that and then uh, when I took Mamas and Papas, uh, which I listened to, uh, I wasn't supposed to do that because I was just supposed to deliver it to the radio station. Uh, when I listened to it, I said, gee, this really sounds good walked into WLS, which was the second most important, powerful radio station in the United States, uh, was heard at 38 states at night. And the program director and disc jockeys were having lunch. And he said, who are you? And I had jeans and a dirty t-shirt on. And I said, my name is Ron. I work at Carmisa. And I was asked to bring you this record. He looks at me and he says, you're interrupting my lunch. Yeah, that's all. <laughs> yeah, interrupting my lunch. Okay. He said, is it a hit? And I said, I think so. He said, are you a gambler? And I was. He said, if I take this and put this on the most power, second most powerful radio station in the United States and the phones don't light up, do you agree never to come back here again? I said, yeah, sure. You know, I got in my car made a right-hand turn on Michigan Avenue, turned on WLS, and I heard California Dreamin' on the radio. That plus what I saw that Saturday, and I said, this is the business that I want to be in. That's how it all started. Ron, that's an incredible story. I've just got goosebumps. You know, well, I was very lucky because if that record was not a hit, if, if if they didn't like it and and the phones didn't light up, I wouldn't be sitting here probably talking to you today. Well, I mean, the, the stars were aligned. The universe worked yeah. in your favor and you were at the right place. It was kind of like, meant, kind of like meant, meant to be. And then and then I came home and I told my parents that story. You know, my father says, you still don't want to go to school? I said, Dad, I'm working in the warehouse. I'm in the record business. You know? <laughs> <laughs> 61 years later, here I am. Well, we talk about inspirational stories, and that certainly is one. And, you know, being a pillar in the music industry for over 60 years, I mean, that is an incredible legacy. 
what do you think was the secret to you finding these chart topping talents and and you know how how did you deal with the fact that that you when you found them um that you weren't really sure right whether they were going to make it or not well it all goes back again to that independent distributor when one day when i i came early to work and there was a blonde lady and a blonde guy standing they got there early in the morning and i walked in there was nobody there but me and the receptionist and they said do you work here i'm going yes i didn't tell them i work in the warehouse and uh, they said, well, my name is Brian Highland, and my name is Dusty Springfield. Oh, okay. Uh, we have a record. Uh, would you listen to it? Yeah, sure. So as I'm going to listen to it, my boss is coming down the steps, and he goes, Ron? Uh, uh, yes. Uh, uh, yes. They said, uh, his name is Ron Alexenberg. He works in the warehouse, and I heard Dusty Springfield wishing and hoping, which ended up being a huge hit record. And that, I met my first two artists. So here I was working in the warehouse, met my first two artists. And later that afternoon, some promotion people, this is what they were called, promotion men and women, they went to the radio stations to beg and plead and get the records played but they were all dressed well. They had nice shirts and ties, and I'm going, what do you do here? He said, I'm a promotion man. Oh, yes, I have to go to lunch. Uh, Lenny, I need $25 in those days. I'm buying so-and-so from the radio station lunch, and I'm going, that's the job I want. I don't want to be in this warehouse. And that's how it all started. We took those records, and the inspiration of listening um, I am hopefully going to be able to finish a book that I've been trying to write. We'll talk about that in a minute. But one of the things to answer your question, I say to people, I say to my children, my grandchildren, my wife, who fortunately was in the music business longer than me, who we met on a blind date. Um, if I can't dance to it, if I can't cry to it, and if I can't want to make love to it, I don't want to hear it. I love this woman already. It's Rochelle, right? Your wife. She yeah. sounds amazing. That is my seven philosophy. Seven months, we courted each other on the phone. I had never been to New York. I'm from Chicago. I called her and I said, uh, is it possible for me to come to New York for New Year's Eve? I figured that's the best time to go there. Oh, and she, oh, I don't know. Uh, she was hesitant about this fast-talking promotion man coming from Chicago to New York and she agreed and that day uh, my mother God rest her soul drove me to the airport in my Corvette she's the only one that I met that knew how to drive a stick shift and she said good luck and I said, yeah, yeah I'm just looking forward to my three days of fun in New York City my boss gave me a hundred dollars to take Rochelle out to dinner New Year's Eve we met at the airport, uh, and that's a whole other story. And she had arranged a nice hotel room, and that night, New Year's Eve, we went out to dinner, and I didn't know you had to make a reservation in a fancy New York restaurant. I walked in with Rochelle at 8 o'clock, table for two, and they made us wait almost two and a half hours. And a beautiful lady, tall came over and she said, you kids are still waiting for a table? I go, yes, ma'am. She said, go sit over there. And there was two empty seats by the bar. We sat down and I had that $100 to spend. So I ordered like a big shot, you know, whatever I could order. And Rochelle being very appreciative, uh, very uh, nice and sweet and talking about how we met and all that. I asked for a check at about 12 o'clock, these huge balloons came down from the ceiling and I got one behind her head and I kissed her, happy new year. And I asked for the check and the waiter comes over and he said, there is none. I said, what? He said, the lady that owns this restaurant did not like the way you were treated. 
So happy new year. I'm going, wait a second. This is too good to be true. And we had the whole night to ourselves. And at six o'clock that morning, after hanging out in Times Square, going to a couple of other places, it was really cold. And I gave her my jacket. And as we were waiting for the subway, New York subways, you know, as we were waiting for the subway, we were uh, seeing a uh, unfortunate individual sitting in a little vestibule. And I wanted to give him some coffee or something. He looks at Rochelle. I can't make this up. He looks at Rochelle and says, you're going to marry him? <laughs> I asked her, did you plant this guy here? <laughs> did you did you plant it? Well, that happened. And then we took the subway. We got off the subway. We walked two blocks in the cold. There was another vestibule. There was another unfortunate in the vestibule. The same thing happened. I can't make this up. You can interview Rochelle. She'll tell you this is what happened. You're going to marry him? It just triggered a thought in my head. Seven months later, I asked her to marry me. Wow. It's been 58 years, and it's been just the best. What a romantic story. How but to answer your question, if I can't dance to it, cry to it, want to make love to it, it had to do with songs, melodies. Being from Chicago, we we had the League of Nations growing up there. We had music, jazz, you know, they didn't categorize music. All music was good to me. Some is just better than others. And I was fortunate enough to have people during my career bring me artists that other people had turned down. I mean, this is amazing that Meatloaf, an album that has sold 40, 50 million, Boston, an album that is the biggest breaking album of all time for a new act. Michael Jackson that was being dropped from Motown. Um, and others that we would listen to with a young staff of people spending CBS's money because they owned Epic Records. From my background at Columbia, where I was promotion head, with all these big names, Barbra Streisand and Jerry Vale and Tony Bennett and Andy Williams and the Birds and Bob Dylan and you know Janis Joplin and Simon and Garfunkel, working with all these great people gave me the confidence when Clive Davis said to me, I'd like you to take over Epic Records. I'm going, ah, I don't, I don't want to leave Columbia. It's the same company. They're on the 13th floor, you're on the 12th floor. And he played me a record from Sly and the Family Stone called I Want to Take You Higher. And I've been doing that ever since. I, I'm just, I'm just in awe, honestly. No, don't be. That, don't no, be. It, 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 just, it absolutely sounds like, you know, it, it, it's, it's, you know, it, no one can write a book like that. And then, you know, the, the, the history and your experiences and, I'm, I can't wait for your book to come out. So tell us a little bit about that. Are you going to make it a little tell-all because you do know a lot of these artists? Well, it's, it's, I'm not going to hold back. Anybody that knows me knows that if I want you to like me, you probably will. If I want you not to like me, you won't, you know, because I tell like it is. And, you know, signing bands that a lot of people and dealing with people that a lot of people were not familiar with, at CBS, we didn't really have African American artists. Mm -hmm. I mean, Johnny Mathis is considered, you know, as white as they come, and he was my dear friend. But I loved rhythm and blues, so I we had the OJ's, the Isley Brothers, Teddy Pendergrass, Patti LaBelle walked into my office with Lady Marmalade. I couldn't understand what the hell she was talking about. Voulez-vous coucher avec moi? And I went. What the hell are you saying? You know, <laughs> and then she says, and you can get your yaya. Well, we put that record out and that record went to number one. And, you know, Carlos Santana with Columbia was a promotion. And I'm listening to Oye Como Va. I had no idea, but I'm promoting a record. Oye Como Va. Yeah. And I'm going, and they go, Ron, do you, do you know what that means? I said, I hope it's not bad. Oh, no, no, it's not. But it was it was the the arrogance, I guess, of being in love with music, 
frustrated that I never played a guitar. I wish I did, or a piano. Um, couldn't really read music, but if I heard something and had a great staff, you see, my part of my success, I admit it everywhere in the book will feature people that I worked with, staff. There was nothing better. I mean, we had a group of secretaries that didn't want to go home. And, and I would get a call from one of their fathers and said, why is my daughter still in the CBS building at eight o'clock at night when it's dark? I said, sir, she's off work at 530. But they're all sitting here listening to music. Then, yeah, that's what I heard. And then you take them downstairs to the bar. Well, yeah, you know, and we just had a lot of fun. And the key word was they love music. And, you know, the artists that we had, the relationships, it's all going to be in my book. And part of my frustration, well, I'm not good with frustrations, is it's taken me almost two and a half years to try and finish this book. And every time I think I'm done, something will trigger, a story will trigger, I got to put it in the book, add, add, add. And it's just appropriate that you would talk to me today. Yesterday, I came very close to making an arrangement with a publisher that will help me finish the book. The name of the book I'll give you as an exclusive is called From the Warehouse to the Penthouse. And that just tells you I... <laughs> I, that's where I started. I ended up at the penthouse at a young age, making more money than I ever thought I'd ever make and spending more money than I ever thought I'd ever make. Well, I'm sure your book is going to be pure magic, just like everything that you've touched in your life. Well, you won't have to buy it. You're very polite. I, I will send it to you. But it's oh, true. Okay. Artists, you know, I'm doing something in this book that that... The publisher yesterday found it very interesting. I, I asked my co-writer to help me. I interviewed 20 of the most influential people in my life. Unfortunately, my parents passed away. Uh, we did recently lose my son at 43 years of age to diabetes. And I demand that we do donate proceeds to the Di Diabetes Alert Dog Foundation which we set up in his name. These are dogs that save people's lives. And because I'm dedicating the book to him, I'll get it done. And having two wonderful daughters and four wonderful grandchildren, you know, they're all pushing me because they hear these stories. And, you know, some of them, the, you know, let me check this out. I have a grandson that's at Emerson who is going to be a, but he, whatever he wants, but a sportscaster, newscaster, does a radio show. Uh, and I said to him, Max, named after my father, God rest his soul, when are you going to interview your grandfather? And he goes, well, you know, the music that I'm into, Coachella and a lot of the bands, I said, Max, I, you're in Boston. I signed a band called Boston. You did? Yeah. Okay, so you know it's it it, it, it it that's the book will hopefully uh, feature the people that helped me get my start uh, telling stories. It's not about me. One of the things I resent in these books that these people write about themselves, you hear the word I I I me me me. I'm not doing that. Yeah, I, I can't stand that. <laughs> Very you know, true. And every time I'll I'll think of something, you know, I'll write it. I mean, there's sure everybody wants to know more about Michael Jackson. Okay. Yes, there will be things and stories in this book of the relationship that I had with this young man that I cherish forever. Um and make a statement or two you know he had the worst father in the world i never got along with his father love his mother uh recently i sat with Catherine, and the kids made up these loomies these little wristbands that go on your wrist and uh having four grandchildren 
I had four Lumis on my wrist. And Catherine says to me, Ron, what are those? And I said, they're things my grandchildren made, you know, in different colors. How many grandchildren do you have, Catherine? 24. I'm going, oh, your whole arm will be full of loopies. But it's a wonderful relationship that I have with her because I said I was asked to monitor Michael's funeral and speak at the funeral. And I did not like the lineup of where they had me speaking at the Staples Center. So I stayed in New York and monitored the funeral for Cablevision for six hours with a lot of tears and a lot of emotion that we still have. Mm -hmm. And the other day they did the MJ show, Broadway show, and my daughter Ivy, uh, who's in uh, the entertainment business, took me to the show. And as I stood there and watched Michael Jackson impersonator dancing, I mean, it, it, it's all the emotion of signing somebody that, again, had I not gone to the Warwick Hotel, picked up the house phone and said, Michael Jackson, please. And they put me right on the phone. And that's how we met. And then I invited him and his family to my home on Long Island to meet my family. Mm -hmm. And that's a whole other story. Well, that's legendary. And we're going to really enjoy reading the book. And um, certainly it's going to be a bestseller. And, you know, aside from your illustrious career, you have also been very active in the community, being the president of the Hollywood Media Association, board member of the Long Island Music Hall of Fame. You've won numerous awards and honors and featured in magazines and on TV globally. You will be featured on the famous NASDAQ billboard in Times Square this September, and you'll be honored at IOTP's annual awards gala in Nashville. That should be fun. But, um, you know, apart from all of that, what do you think is the, the one experience that you've had in your career that has stood out for you? Well, getting married to my best friend, being the mother of our children, uh, ha having my parents see their son successful at what he set out to be, uh, being able to buy them a home in New York and move from Chicago. I mean, there's, there's so many wonderful things that the music business afforded, has afforded, and continues to afford me. Um, our youngest daughter, Marnie, uh, is a graduate of NYU, couldn't get a job as an actress in New York, came out to California, screen tested for a movie called Something About Mary, and there she was with Cameron Diaz making her first movie. Yeah. Uh, having my oldest daughter, Ivy, graduating from the University of Arizona, went to work for Jay Leno and ended up being the talent booker for The Tonight Show. You know, I mean, so many positive, wonderful things that keep me going. I have a responsibility to them. Um, I have a responsibility to uh, those who b believe in me. Uh, still, uh, as I told uh, Stephanie, when you honor somebody lifetime achievement, it's like the end of their career. I said, Mine is not over. And uh, I try to still listen. I'm still involved. I still look to help young people uh, with uh, their singers, songwriters. Um, that, that, that is what I listen to. Uh, I despise uh, AT&T for taking CD players out of their laptops and car manufacturers taking cd players out of their cars uh, we don't have what we had in radio we don't have the openness that used to be with radio uh, if i can i'd just like to correct you on a couple of things the hollywood media professionals hmp stands for the professionals out here that dealt with radio and television and music and I'm fortunate to go into my fourth year as being 
uh, president uh, where we honor people uh, in the business. And I'm also, as part of the Long Island Music and Radio Hall of Fame, I'm also inducted as well as a board member. And we have a, a museum uh, that I want everyone to come see on Long Island in Stony Brook. So, you know, being in California and having roots still back east, you know, makes it difficult. But I am coming back thanks to Stephanie and we'll be in Times Square. And the irony of two things that she doesn't realize, when I left CBS, I have a picture, I'll bring her and show her. They put my name up in Times Square, Ron Alexenberg CBS Records. And all the years that I went to Nashville, very successful with Tammy Wynette and George Jones and Charlie Daniels, my dearest friend, and uh, jo uh, you know uh, Charlie Rich, my wife, had never gone with me. I have never invited her. And she was always upset with me that I never took her to Nashville. So now she's going to get to go to Nashville. And she said, can we drive to Memphis and go through Alvis's house? Yes. <laughs> so here it is. Many years later, this comes to be. And being of Jewish faith, there's a word called besher. It means meant to be. It was all like meant to be, you know, and uh, having people that I want to thank in my book starts with my parents and it starts with staff people, because without my staff, this wouldn't have been possible. Well, you know, this is going to be a great celebration for you in Nashville, not only because Rochelle will be there, but because we are going to honor you from IOTP's side truly truly you deserve every award and and just all your accomplishments it's been amazing chatting to you today to hear more about it and i'm sorry i'm not going to be in nashville i have to be in namibia in africa i'm going to be working uh, with the children trust but i will hopefully see you in, in september in new york well, so. yes i i will be there uh my dear friend steve castleton who is also being honored uh, he and I uh, will be sharing a hotel room, the 6th, 7th, and 8th, which Rochelle says, can I go? Oh, no, no, no. I, I just, I, but, <laughs> that should be interesting. But, you know, the, the amazing thing, and I understand that you're part of Africa, one of my dearest relationships, which we'll hear about in my book, was a man named Mickey Most. Mickey Most produced Herman's Hermits, The Animals, The Yardbirds, Jeff Beck, uh, Lulu to Sir with Love. When I left CBS, you know, wondering what I was going to do, where I was going to go, I started this little label, Infinity Records, and I was not equipped to own the name, which I should have. But we had Rupert Holmes, Pina Colada, Spira Gyra, um, Orleans, and he came from South Africa. And, uh, you know, international is so important mm -hmm. and i hope when this reaches out to people that the people who are outside the united states can understand there are people like me that will listen to their music because all music is good some is just better than others you know and the melodies and these young people uh, need to know from the past from the goes back to the 40s, but the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s created such a, a wealth. I mean, I was told at a recent honor that from 1972 to 1979, Epic Records and the associated labels had 150 hit records. Never to be repeated by anybody. You can take Warner Brothers and Capital and put them together. That doesn't happen. Why? Because we had a young, aggressive, positive people. And like I said before, don't go home. I would call Rochelle and say, I'm on my way home. That would be 6 o'clock, 9 o'clock. I'm coming in the house. She said, what happened to you? Uh, I got busy, you know. But Well, she's uh, a true saint for, for yeah. looking after you all these years. Oh, yeah.
<laughs> I mean, if anybody wants to do, which nobody's done yet, I said, interview her. Interview her. You know, don't talk about me. Actually, actually I would love that. That would well, be she, very she, insightful. She can tell you the heart and soul and the tears, you know, when we lost Michael and we've lost some other artists, you know, and and uh, it's very difficult. Took him into our home, had him stay with us. She was at United Artist Records. And that's how I met her on the phone. Was, but it I'm sorry. was it difficult, the two of you working in the same industry? No, no, because she loved music. And, uh, you know, she was in it right out of high school, got a job. Um, and we met on the phone. Uh, I was a distributor in New York, in Chicago. And she was in New York. And... We talked music and we talked to artists and she had met people like Burt Lancaster and actors and Connie Francis long before me. And uh, it was easy for her to understand the excitement that I would have when a record like Do Wah Diddy, Manfred Mann came out and I promoted it and it was a hit. And it, there was so many records in the past, you know, uh, there's a young man, 90 years of age, Frankie Valley, who lives near me. He's retiring, and we laughed because the Four Seasons, I promoted those records in those days. But it's the universal language, you know, and it's fortunate. I, I thank you for this podcast. I thank you for this interview. I'm sorry you won't be in Nashville, but I will see you in New York. Absolutely. And before we go, I'm sure everybody's itching to know this. Was there anybody in your career that you, any talent that was out there that you might have... Now, you're a wise guy. I saw your question. I knew you were going to ask me. I was figuring maybe I'm going to get away without answering that. Where are you going to? Well, no. I, 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 think, I think it was terrific. There are a couple of artists that I really wanted. I mean, one was Otis Redding. Um, when I heard Dock of the Bay, I don't know if I could imagine any record bigger than that. Um, there were a couple of artists that uh, we just couldn't afford uh, when they would play me their demo and their song. And later on in their career, they would go to other labels. Uh, one of the ones that I wanted in the worst way was Fleetwood Mac. But, oh, you know, my favorites oh well, there you go there you go and it's the irony of my oldest daughter loving stevie nicks and i said when i get to see stevie i'm gonna tell her a little interesting story but we had artists like dave mason because of a song feeling all right i mean the words and those songs i mean i could give you a list it's not just one but you know if I had my chance to sign the Beatles, of course, you know, that's easy. Uh, but they changed music. The Bee Gees, I wanted them in the worst way. I got on a fishing boat to try and sign them, and I'd never gone deep sea fishing in my life. I almost wrecked my whole life trying to wheel in, trying to be Joe Cool with Barry Gibb and Brian Gibb and them. And I'm, yeah, I can handle this. And there's no way I could have wheeled in, but trying to sign the Bee Gees because there's the creative juices. I mean, they had it writing those songs, Grease and all that. But there are, there are a couple. I don't know. Well, Ron, you certainly had enough of your own wonderful successes. So I'm sure that there are no regrets there. Um, and, and just thinking the about successes, the best successes I have, as you see, displayed, these are brother and sister, Max and Ryan, and these are Cozy and Brady, our grandchildren. I and love that about love you. Love that as my daughter and her husband, Ivy, and there's Marnie. And, you know, I love mean... love that about you, that you have pictures of your family behind you and not a million trophies and records and accolades. And that that is just, that is just exemplary of who you are as a person. Just Great. really so down to earth and such a wonderful man, such a wonderful family man. No, Thank it's been you. an absolute pleasure, a real, real honor to to chat to you. I don't, today. as Stephanie will tell you, I don't believe in goodbyes. So I believe in to be continued. 
and I thank you for your time and your interest and your wonderful smile. And if there's anything I can do, I'm a phone call away. Well, thanks, Ron. I'm going to definitely dial your number to answer a few more questions. Offline. I love that expression. <laughs> <That's the number. laughs> There's no dials anymore. It's pressing buttons. I know. That's saying. You just dated that's yourself. Okay. You just dated yourself. I know what a dial is. <laughs> My son doesn't even like um, when I talk to him about what telephones used to look like and Walkmans and even CDs. So, I mean, that's crazy. My son's 25 now. So, yeah, I mean, I know. But at least we're living the life. We're living the best life. So yes. I'm being so grateful to chat to you. How, how, does, how do our listeners get hold of you if they would like to? Well, I think it's best to contact Stephanie. You know, she knows how to get a hold of me. Okay. Uh because I, I, quite it's, honestly, it's, I do get, I do get, uh, especially out here, I get people. Oh, uh, you're in the music business. I have a daughter. Oh, oh, oh. oh my gosh! I, I, and, and I listen. I try to be polite, but you can't believe because I'm not into the rap world. Okay, that's just not me. Uh, I love the country is back, big time. Right. I love the Taylor Swift her own songs. Billy Eilish, her own songs. You know, that's the creativity. Until you can come to me with that, you know. But getting a hold of me, I think Stephanie can probably weed it through. And and I'm always willing to try and help young people achieve their goals. Because one of the great albums that I ever worked with, John McLaughlin, had a title of an album called My Goals Beyond. And if you can't set your goals beyond... I don't want to, I don't think I want to know you. Well, you are so inspirational, Ron. I can't wait to see you and Rochelle very soon. So please look after yourselves until then and live your best uh, life as you do. Uh, God yeah. bless. Lots of love. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I can do it. <laughs> Thank you so much. The best. Thank Have you. A good one. Bye for now. 